Hello and welcome. So we're really excited to be joining you here at the Disruptive Innovation Festival, the DIFF, and uh, you're joining us here in Amsterdam in Metabolic HQ. So uh, today we're here to talk about uh, Towards the Circular City, designing and planning urban ecosystems. Um, so why cities, why is that such an important topic for the Disruptive Innovation Festival? Well, cities uh, occupy about 3% occupy about of the global land surface, but despite that, half the world's population lives in cities. Um, they also consume about three quarters of global resources and produce uh, or responsible for up to 80% of greenhouse gases. So really cities are key leverage points for a circular economy and trying out new approaches that can really shift the global economy. Um, why us, who are we? Well, well, we're Metabolic. Metabolic is a consulting and venture building company that uses systems thinking to tackle a major sustainability challenges. And um, our mission, uh, our global mission, is to transition the economy to a fundamentally sustainable and circular state. Um, so yeah, we're headquartered in Amsterdam, but we work internationally with governments, businesses, and nonprofits. And uh, we're really excited to talk to you a bit more about the work that we've been doing uh, across those sectors, uh, across those areas, and uh, specifically related to cities and the built environment today. So let me introduce our two experts my esteemed colleagues here to my right. So here we have Gerard Rumers, and uh, Gerard is, uh, leads several of the university collaborations that we have here in the Netherlands. He's also developed a number of uh, circular economy strategies for um, urban regions across the Netherlands and also part of our uh, growing and expanding international work as well. And um, most recently and quite excitingly developed some indicators and tools for circular tendering in the built environment, which is already starting to be used here in Amsterdam. And uh, Nadine Gaal here on my right. Um, Nadine's done a lot of work with our showcase of applied circular urban development here at De Koval in Amsterdam. And if you haven't been there already, if you're ever in Amsterdam, please do check that out because it's a really, really inspiring and interesting place to see how some of these ideas are being practically applied. Also, Nadine leads, um, has led a number of studies into sustainable transition on various scales from festivals to islands and airports, most recently working with Schiphol, which is a really exciting part of our work to, to work with these large organizations to, to shift the way that they can uh, lead the transition to the economy. Um, so that's uh, enough from me. I'm now going to pass over to Gerard, who's going to get straight into the topic of circular cities. Thank you. Um, yeah, indeed. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about how to uh, plan, design and develop uh, circular cities. And um, I think that merits starting off with actually defining what a circular city is and what it means um, uh, if you want to develop towards that ideal. Um, so like Adam already mentioned, uh, cities at the moment are actually resource drains. They are uh, consuming a vast amount of resources. They are uh, drawing these resources and the energy that they need um, to sustain themselves from their hinterland. And um, basically the ideal of a circular city is uh, uh, very simply um <coughs> trying to move cities from uh, uh, linear resource drains from uh, places where you consume a lot of resources and you generate a lot of waste to uh, uh, an urban environment where these resources are cycled infinitely and at high value. Um, that is the core of it. Um, if you want, you can imagine cities as having uh, a metabolism of their own, just like humans, if you will. Um, they grow, literally, if you're expanding, of course. Uh, um <coughs> we have uh, vast landscapes that have been consumed in this way by uh, the growing suburbs of cities around uh, the globe, especially in, uh, in the US, of course, a uh, very stereotypical example. Um, cities consume vast amounts of resources, products, energy, um, and um, eventually, uh, at least part of the city usually also ages and dies. There's a lot of uh, redevelopment, uh, demolition and new build going on in these cities. And altogether, these processes uh, um, create what we call the urban metabolism. So it's the sum total of the technical and also the social economic processes that are taking place in a city that lead to um, uh, the pattern of energies, material, uh, uh, water and nutrients going through the city um, uh, and that lead to their pattern of production and also consumption and waste uh, generation taking place there. So basically the ideal of a circular city is achieved when you could uh, uh, say that the metabolism of a city has become uh, circular rather than linear. And when you can see that rather than being a resource drain, a city is actually uh, 
uh, as, uh, uh, giving something back to the broader environment, having a positive impact on the hinterland rather than just taking from it. It does not mean that a circular city is autarkic. It doesn't mean that you need to produce and you need to uh, uh, generate all the resources you need right here and there, uh, right there. Um, of course, there's there's plenty of uh, uh, production processes that you can think of that actually require faster amounts of lands and economies of scale. Just think about farming, for example. It doesn't make sense to do all of that in a city. Um, but the paradigm of a circular city does help you to uh, uh, um, uh, take a second look at what's going on there and to see whether there are cycles that can be closed in an urban environment. And there's many opportunities to do so, as we'll also see uh, when Nadine is taking over uh, from me later th throughout this talk and uh, provides us with a couple of practical examples of how you can achieve a circular city. Um, I do want to uh, emphasize here that a circular city is about much more than just the uh, recycling of materials. Uh, um, you'll probably be familiar with the concept of a circular economy. Um, similarly uh, to a circular economy, a circular city is not just about high value reuse of materials or about closing energy cycles, but it's also about um, creating uh, not just an, a, a low impact environment, but also a society that is inclusive and that allows people to develop uh, uh, um, <coughs> uh, and, and to flourish basically uh, according to uh, the norms and the ideals that we've developed as a society. So there is an environmental side to this, but there's also very clearly a cultural and a social and an economic side. Uh, and this integrated picture is very important when you're uh, looking at redevelopment uh, uh, in an, um, throughout the city. Um, so <coughs> indeed, it's about uh, energy landscapes, it's about the physical flows, it's about uh, uh, waste treatment. But a circular city is also about building with nature and creating greener and more healthy urban environments for people to live in, to create a more livable city, to create a climate resilient city. So uh, it's, it's, it's much broader than you might think. Um, a circular city is also uh, about finding new functions for the urban environment, about finding new... Well, basically it's about decentralized re resource uh, management to a large extent. And that means that a lot of the things that we're um, doing centrally and quite far away uh, outside of your daily life at the moment might come back uh, into uh, the street view in a circular city. So one example is uh, the wastewater treatment systems that we have at the moment. You, you never see those. You've, I mean, once the last time you uh, walked across the street and you were actually consciously thinking about what happens with all of the wastewater flows and the nutrients uh, in those um, that you flush away daily. You don't because it's not visible. Similarly, energy systems are usually tucked away at the edge of the city at the most, if not further. And so you don't see these things and you don't engage with, uh, with them on a daily basis. In a circular city, this might very well change. Um, that does mean that if you uh, want to pull these systems back in, to, for example, the neighborhood or the district that you live in, you need to find creative ways of doing so that also uh, uh, fit within uh, a more densely populated urban environment. So you might want to combine uh, uh, wastewater uh, treatment with actually creating beautiful natural parks, biological treatment systems, rather than these big centralized industrialized systems that actually are tucked away far from where you live for a very good reason. They're not very appealing to uh, uh, walk through and engage with. Um, similarly, if we want to close at least more of the material cycles that we're dealing with in a city, it might mean that there's a, a, a new type of manufacturing and a new type of creative industry coming back to the city. We might want to uh, see what we can actually do with our waste flows right here and now and uh, see if we can add value and uh, create uh, uh, from those uh, in the city itself rather than uh, uh, sending them far away. And um, so it might mean that a new type of is coming, uh, manufacturing and creative industries is coming back to the city uh, um, uh, and will allow us to actively engage in this whole recycling process. Um, there's a couple of key challenges to overcome though if we want to actually achieve this ideal of a circular city. Um, 
One of them is that we currently really don't understand the way cities function and the way uh, uh, the material and energy flows go through them to uh, uh, um, a large enough extent to actually manage these uh, circularly. So we need to break open the black box, if you will, of the city. We need to find out um, uh, how we can design also spatially our cities in a, in a better way uh, so that we can create uh, closed cycled systems. Uh, a second, if you, uh, like I mentioned before, want to uh, start closing cycles, energy, material, water at a more decentral level, this also means that you'll uh, uh, want uh, to engage much more with the people that are living in these districts and neighborhoods. So that they actually benefit from this whole process, uh, otherwise there's no point and also no willingness to bring, bring these things back in, into the city. Uh, and thirdly, uh, it's very important to realize that, and you could have already uh, um, read through the lines in the way I described the circular city as well, we don't know what this is going to look like exactly. Uh, aside from the fact that even if we would now at this point, technology is of course changing. So um, uh, because we don't know exactly what we're heading for, we need uh, to create room for experiments and we need to also not be uh, too scared to try and fail and uh, uh, do a bit of rapid prototyping in this sense. Um, and this is very important because uh, it's basically the only way to move forward. Um, so in order to achieve that, uh, we feel at Metabolic that the concept of an urban living lab, where you try out these new types of infrastructure, where you try out this new type of engagement with uh, uh, inhabitants and citizens, uh, is crucial. It can allow you the, the space that you need to uh, experiment and to innovate. And uh, my colleague Nadine will tell uh, a bit more about how we've applied this concept in a practical way in Amsterdam. Thank you so much, Gerard, for that uh, a great introduction to a lot of the work that we do. Um, what I'm here uh, to do is to tell you a story, a story of the development work that we've done in, uh, in Amsterdam, our home city. Now, when I say development, I mean that for the last um, five years, we've been very actively involved in the development of a, of a certain neighborhood here in Amsterdam North. That neighborhood is called Baxloterham. It holds a very special place in our hearts because the city of Amsterdam has actually dubbed it an official living laboratory, drawing upon a lot of the work that we've done. Um, this experimental zone uh, and that living lab way of working that Geert was explaining before in his in his talk uh, are really crucial to the way that we uh, that we that we scale up e experiments and be able to test a lot of these different initiatives in Bagsloterham to not only take it from these small little pilot projects that we have going them but really uh, take it further to the entire neighborhood, eventually to the entire city of Amsterdam, and hopefully to the entire country. For us, where it all started was the Keuvel. Uh, the Keuvel uh, is uh is extremely special to Metabolic because it was also um, our first project five years ago. The Keuvel, um, more concretely, is a, a former shipyard. It's a terrain of about 4,400 square meters. And uh, the city of Amsterdam had all kinds of plans of what they wanted to do with this area. But with the financial crisis in 2008, a lot of these plans came to a halt, uh, which meant that uh, the city of Amsterdam uh, basically had the terrain uh, be laid abandoned for, uh, for e even more than a decade. Um, in 2011, 2012, plans started brewing to maybe bring out these sustainability tenders. And that's exactly what they did at the Keuvel. Um, they said, here is, a, is an old polluted shipyard uh, laying abandoned. Who has a creative idea of what we can do with this area to bring more value, not only to the terrain, but also to the surrounding neighborhood? We came in, Metabolic, as sustainability partners, uh, together with uh, some key architectural firms, Space and Matter and Marjolein Smele, among others. We came in as sustainability partners uh, to come up with this complete concept for what an ideal circular urban development would look like. The plan was to take um, to take old recycled uh, secondhand houseboats, take a really typical but also very unique waste product to Amsterdam, be able to put them on land and retrofit them with all kinds of clean technologies. We did this, but of course, um, why would you place them on land? Well, it's because there was uh, there were no buildings in this uh, on this terrain, and the city of Amsterdam w wanted to uh, create a thriving office park, but it was also temporary in nature. We we won a lease uh, to develop this area for ten years. 
And being able to, re uh, to use a lot of these reused and recycled materials um, led to uh, a really creative use of the space. These different houseboats have been connected by a winding boardwalk, um, and uh, which uh, has a garden underneath it. So basically, when you're there, and I invite you all to come, should you ever be in Amsterdam next, is um, it, it gives this impression that you're floating amongst the grass. Instead of floating on water, you're floating amongst the grass and being connected to all these different houseboat offices. Now, it's a sustainable uh, park for eco-innovation, but it also has a very special purpose. It's actually a creative incubator. What that means is that um, all the different houseboat offices on the Kuyv will uh, house different uh, creative and social uh, companies, so different uh, creative and social entrepreneurs. These things can range from landscape architects to uh, graphic designers, filmmakers, photographers, but also things like uh, the headquarters of the Dutch Weed Burger is there, uh, an alternative hand burger based on seaweed. Uh, those are just some examples of some of the companies that are, that are placed at the Govel. Now, when I say eco-innovation, it's because we're very much pro uh, focused on being able to test a lot of these ecological and nature-based solutions on the ground in real conditions. One of the ways, one of the most prominent ways we've done that is experimenting with phytoremediation. Phytoremediation is a process where you can use plants, uh, mo mainly grasses, uh, willows, and poplar trees to clean the soil over time. Now these plants don't actually have the capacity to process a lot of the heavy metal contamination that's in the soil at the Koval, but they do have the capacity to take them up through their roots. Any good phytoremediation plant is one that take, can take up a lot of water. They take up those heavy metals with the water through their roots, they hold on to them, and as soon as they get too large, as in they're hanging over the boardwalk and people can't get through anymore, you can chop them down and you can uh, let them compost slightly and incinerate them. What happens then is you're left with ash, uh, which, the heavy metal, uh, which contains the heavy metals. From there, you can, um, uh, you can dispose of this safely. Now what this does is a way to cost-effectively and solar-powered way to clean the soil over time. It's a process that takes 30 to 40 years, but the amazing thing here is you can actually use the terrain, get a lot of value of it while you're cleaning the soil. It's really in stark contrast to a lot of the typical soil remediation we see in, in city development. Another interesting pilot project that we're working on um, is the production of, um, well, we have solar panels for the production of our energy needs across the site. So on, all, on almost all of the roofs uh, of the houseboat offices, they're outfitted with solar panels. We're producing about 36,000 kilowatt hours um, of energy per year. Um, and recently, um, our spin-off company, Spectral, which focuses on smart grid um, energy to solutions to accelerate the renewable energy transition, has developed a, a pilot project with Aliander, an energy utility firm in Amsterdam, which, uh, which focuses on uh, being able to have an energy uh, token based on blockchain technology. Basically, each boat has been outfitted with what's called a block box, which can track the production and consumption of the, of the solar energy in real time. Should you overproduce, well, you can actually earn a Juliet, which you can in turn uh, exchange uh, for a beer at the cafe, and the cafe can use it um, to pay their energy bill. Now this is fantastic uh, because uh, the cafes, being the biggest building, are the big energy hogs on site. And it's also a very interesting social experiment um, because uh, if you're actually knowing how much energy you're, uh, you're producing, according to research, um, you'll use 15% less. Now, we're also experimenting with closing a lot of um, resource cycles um, at the Goeval. One of the ways that we're doing this is composting uh, human feces, or humanure. And uh, the way that we do this is um, each houseboat office has been outfitted with a, uh, with a composting toilet, a dry composting toilet. What this means is that you're separating uh, urine from the waste. Uh, the waste is collected and composted, and after two years' time, after it's reached a five-day period of 65 degrees Celsius and higher, you actually have safe compost that you can use, not for food production, but for the garden, uh, the phytoremediation garden. So you're being able to uh, use um, your, this compost to actually aid a lot of the phytoremediation processes that are happening by adding nutrients and all kinds of other good organic matter to the soil. 
The, um, the thing with experimenting with, uh, with alternative sanitation pilots like this is you need to think quite critically about uh, your wastewater. Since we don't have a connection to the normal sewer line and do all of this decentra uh, decentralized, we need to think uh, quite out of the box on how we're going to deal uh, with our gray water. Now remember, these are houseboat offices, so there's no showers, anything like that. It's a small volume of water just from a bathroom and a kitchen sink. Still, it's illegal to just dump that water back into the ground. Uh, so together with our partners, uh, uh, Vaternet and KWR, uh, a research institute, uh, we developed these, uh, these helophyte filters, um, uh, which is basically a decentralized way to, to treat your gray water. Uh, you have two tanks. One is a little bit higher than the other. It goes through a layer of elephant grass and different uh, aggregate layers and goes through the, which is basically a fancy word for small little rocks and other things of that nature. It goes into the second uh, second tank, so you don't need an electric pump, it's just by gravity because it's lower, where it goes through the same process and then it's discharged back into the ground. Now, the important thing is that for the first two years of this project, we published quarterly research reports to, in, uh, to show not only this, that this technology works, but that the water was in fact safe to be discharged back into the ground. Now, as I mentioned, these composting toilets that we have um, in two locations on the Coeville are actually um, diverting urine as well. So we have a pure stream of urine. Now, why would you want this? Well, when we're diluting our urine, um, we actually are, are, are losing uh, the, um, uh, the, the volumes that we have of the, of the most valuable stuff that we have in urine, things like nitrogen and phosphorus. When you keep it as a, as a pure, undiluted stream, what you can do with it is you can make struvite. How we do this is through our struvite reactor, you add magnesium to pure urine, and from there you get a magnesium ammonium phosphate, struvite, and the struvite can then be added to, uh, uh, to, the, to the greenhouse that we have, for example. Now, speaking of greenhouses, uh, we have one at the Coeville. Um, it experiments with an aquaponics system. An aquaponics system, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a, a form of alternative agriculture, where instead of using um, soil or earth uh, to grow your plants in, uh, you're using um, a medium often. Of course, there's different forms you can have, but a medium in which you can put your plants in. We use a lava rock. Um, we have a vertical system, like you can see on the slide, which basically means that the water, which has been enriched um, with uh, fish uh, wastes, uh, which are adding the nutrients for the system. The water trickles down in this vertical system, and what happens is really twofold. On the one hand, uh, the nutrients are being taken up by the plants, and on the other hand, uh, the plants are filtering the water so the fish get clean water again. It's essentially a, a really nice closed loop system that we use for a lot of our educational programming, especially with children, because it's such a nice example of what a circular economy would look like on a small scale. Um, one of the other projects that we've been very closely involved with um, at, um, in, within Bagsloser Home is something called Schoonschip. Schoonschip means clean ship, literally, in English. And uh, what Schoonschip has done is, uh, with the same architects, and again, us metabolic and sustainability partners, has taken a lot of the lessons that we've learned um, and all of the things that we think hold a lot of value for scaling up and being able to implement them in this new project. Schoonschip is a, um, going to be a, uh, not only a, a living laboratory, but also a residential area. It's going to be home to 46 different uh, families uh, that are living in different apartments. It's going to be on water. So in a way, we're instead of, it's kind of a reverse of the Goebel. So we're taking um, houses on water instead of taking houses on land like we've done at the Goebel. Um, and uh, what it'll do is in the same way of the Goebel, it'll focus on being able to really close all of these different nutrient, energy, and material cycles in a scale that makes sense. And what I mean by that is um, one of the most important lessons that we've learned out of the Goebel was, for example, experimenting with these compost toilets. Now, a compost toilet is quite a big ask of a user, and um, while it works on a small small scale at the Goeville, it's not necessarily um, the most effective solution that you want to use in a residential area. But the same uh, idea of being able to extract value from this resource flows still exists. And one of the ways that we want to scale this up is that all of the different uh, houses at, at Schoonschip will be outfitted with vacuum toilets. These vacuum toilets will immediately uh, divert three different streams, gray, yellow, and black water. These three different streams will travel under their boardwalk onto the embankment, which uh, houses this local urban biorefinery. This, again, will be 
financed by Waternet, the local water authority board um, uh, here in Amsterdam. And what it'll be able to do is it'll immediately be able to, to take out all of these uh, important nutrient streams and perhaps be able to use them again for local agriculture on Schoonschip itself. Um, now the nice thing with this is, <coughs> the nice thing with this is that of course for 46 households on Schoonschip, this still doesn't really make a lot of financial sense. But when you calculate it through, and with all of the new residences that are and infrastructure and buildings that are coming uh, within Bagsloterham in the next 20 years, you could actually scale this up to be connected to more than 2,000 households. And then it's actually price competitive with the normal wastewater treatment plant. So it's this really interesting way of seeing what makes sense at what scale when we transition towards circular cities. Bagsloter home. I mentioned it previously. Bagsloter home is the neighborhood in which all of this is happening. It was uh, the former thriving port of Amsterdam. Um, it was home to uh, the Royal Dutch Shell uh, headquarters, uh, to Fokker Aviation, to a lot of other really uh, big, great, well-known Dutch companies. Uh, it's also a polder, uh, which means that it was built in the late 1800s with sludge and whatever other materials that they could find in that time. That, mixed with its industrial use, has led to a lot of heavy contamination in this area. Even though it's quite um, uh, close to the to the to the center of Amsterdam, there is a river in between it, which means you need to take a ferry across if you're a pedestrian or you're on bicycle. There's a tunnel underneath if you're by car, um, which meant that there was a lot of disconnect between the two areas of the city. Uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, even this wasn't necessarily an area um, that a lot of central Amsterdam Amsterdamers even considered Amsterdam, even though it always was. And recently, it's gotten this um, really big research and development. And the reason for that is because it's essentially um, because of a lot of the former industrial areas and a lot of the abandoned manufacturing that's that's left over there. It uh, forms as this blank canvas, and this blank canvas is very interesting when we move towards circular urban development because the earlier on in the development process, I would argue even from the tendering phase, the better um, it is for developing these circular cities. In the coming 20 years, the city of Amsterdam wants um, uh, wants uh, 6,500 uh, future people living in this area and another 8,000 people working in this area, which means that a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, will it be ready in these 20 years? Um, in 2014, uh, we were commissioned by the city of Amsterdam to do, after the successful launch of the Govel, to do an entire um, material flow analysis and also circularity uh, scan of Bagsoter Hum. Basically, what that means is being able to map out exactly what's coming into this area, what's coming out, how it's processing, um, and then from there being able to, to project what these streams would look like in 20 years and develop a vision and a roadmap and set a very, very uh, clear set of goals about what this, uh, what this system should uh, have in the next 20 years. Um, these things cover everything from um, making sure all the energy is from uh, renewable sources, making sure that materials are cycled at a high way. Essentially, the seven pillars of circular economy that Claire had mentioned before, these are applied at an urban development scale. Now, the amazing thing that came out of this report, and it's something that we really strive at Metabolic, is not just to produce reports that end up collecting dust on a shelf, but really work towards implementing our research, is that in uh, March 2015, um, based on the success of this report called Circular Bag Slaughter Hum, the city of Amsterdam, us, and 20 other partners, and that ranged from everything, everybody from small architectural firms, uh, project developers, uh, Waternets, the Regional Water Authority Board, Aliander, utility companies, um, social housing, uh, housing corporations, social housing interest groups, Everybody, um, these 25 different partners, uh, got on board to sign the Circular Bagsloter Home Manifesto. And what this meant is, of course, it's not a legally binding document, but what it meant is that all these parties committed to developing in this way for the next 20 years. And that is crucial to, uh, to ensuring that it, it actually happens. And the really great thing is a lot of uh, exciting projects have rolled out of this uh, since signing this manifesto a little over two years ago. 
One of them is that you see even commercial developments. You know, now we have the financial crisis is nearly uh, 10 years ago, and a lot of commercial interest is coming back uh, into this area. Now, even these groups, uh, we've been helping to make sure that um, whatever uh, developments they're creating, whether they're luxurious waterfront apartments or, um, or office buildings, making sure that these principles of circularity are coming back should they want to develop in this area of Bagsloter home. For this, we always set a goal, um, uh, a key uh, set of, of, of circularity goals, and from there we work towards key performance indicators so we can actually measure their, their performance and progress over time. Another exciting project was the PUMA project, which stands for Prospecting um, the Urban Mines of Amsterdam. Uh, what this did uh, was it was a collaboration with um, the Technical University of Delft, Leiden University, and the Vach Society. And uh, what we did with them is, is basically map out where are the most important uh, different um, metals. So it was this bottom-up model of different, uh, of different metals, so things like steel, aluminum, copper, in the built environment in Amsterdam. And the reason why we do this is as we move to having increasingly scarcer resources, we need to look at our urban centers as these key mines, uh, key mines for the materials that we need in the built environment in the future. And uh, the last example that I want to uh, that I want to tell you about is something I alluded to a little bit earlier thinking about this tendering phase. So it's become increasingly popular for the city of Amsterdam to bring out these tenders as a way to kickstart a lot of the organic bottom-up development that that circular uh, urban development is all about. And one of the ways we can do this is through uh, circular tendering. The city of Amsterdam asked us about a year ago to develop a key, uh, really a handbook uh, for civil service within the city of Amsterdam should they have a tender and they, how do they, uh, basically a handbook and a guidebook of how can they d decide at the, just at the tendering phase which development is likely to be most circular. And we developed a series of criteria and performance indicators for them to be able to measure this at such an early phase. Now, for all the work that we've done within this area, there still remain uh, what we've defined as three key challenges. And I'm going to pass it over to Geert again to tell you more about that. Thanks, Nadine. So indeed, there's three, uh, three challenges that we see. The first one is a bit more uh, academic, uh, although I have to say uh, uh, I love geeking out on this problem. Um, we have to break open the black box of the city. We need to understand the urban metabolism in much more detail than we do now. Um, if we're being honest, then even in the scientific field, uh, as an in industrial ecologist, we see that the city is often treated as uh, um, a, a single black box. So we understand a bit uh, what goes in and what goes out. We're basically doing material accounting, if you will, but we don't really understand what's driving the metabolic pattern of the city. So we don't really understand why uh, material flows and energy flows are running the way they do, why they are released, why, uh, what the frequency is behind these things, what the actual process behind the urban metabolism is. And that is something that we really need to understand in much more detail if we also want to change this metabolic pattern. Um, Secondly, if we feel that uh, a circular city is the way to go, we also need to ensure that we uh, engage and empower citizens through creating these circular cities. And there needs to be a clear reward and a payoff and also a genuine enthusiasm for everybody living in the city uh, to engage in this process. process. It's, it's quite a, a, a large uh, and visionary project, so we really need to get everybody on board in a good way. Uh, and I think a project like the Juliet, which Nadine already referred to, uh, uh, shows how you can do that. Uh, that's about much more than just the immediate economic incentive that's behind this. It's also about creating communities that are managing their uh, uh, energy flows, in this case, together in a good way. And uh, through this you can create not just a closed cycle, but also more social cohesion and more interaction at the neighborhood level. So you can have more payoff than just your uh, uh, environmental impacts that you're trying to reduce. Um, above all, though, uh, context uh, is key. So what we saw in Buikslauter Ham is that there is no silver bullet uh, solution, there is no blueprint for a circular city, and, and, and we should not try and make one. We really need to look every time again when we're engaging at uh, redevelopment at the neighborhood level um, or for different cities, what fits there. Uh, what works well with that local community, what works well given the physical conditions that you have there, the types of infrastructure uh, that are already on the ground or in the ground. Um, and it's, it's uh, um, 
quite uh, quite important to make sure that you connect to that rather than just roll over uh, uh, with your own ideas. Um, so I think these are three uh, challenges we we should try and uh, um, uh, um, solve in a way. Um, and there's also a couple of keys to success and, and a couple of uh, uh, things that can help us do that. Uh, I think one is um, uh, basically looking carefully at the spatial factors that you have in a neighborhood. Like we already said, for Buikslotter Ham, there was quite a lot of playing room, literally, uh, to develop new things and to uh, 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 set up new housing, set up new infrastructure. You need a bit of this uh, 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 um, literal space. Um, where there are uh, areas, for example, the city center where this is not available, we might also want to adapt our ambitions. It's not so bad if one neighborhood in the city actually uh, relies completely on its own energy production or maybe even generates a surplus, whereas, for example, the city center with a lot of historic buildings and a lot of more uh, dense population and use might not be able to do that. So we can shift around uh, like this as well. Uh, the second key is to set up uh, a really uh, uh, energized and engaged community. Uh, we didn't have to do all the work at the Keuvel or Buikslotterham or Schoonschip ourselves. In fact, far from it. Uh, we've done it together with a really, really uh, large group of people who put their heart and soul into it. And uh, only by doing it like this, by really engaging with everybody that you uh, want to collaborate with and that you need also to collaborate and coordinate with, um, you can bring things further. Um, lastly, like I said, um, this approach of a living lab and actually designating spaces in your city for novel things, for innovation, for experiments is key. I think if we didn't have that leeway, if we didn't have that space to uh, also play around with in, uh, in the sense of uh, a bit less uh, top-down government and a bit more governance uh, with everybody together, uh, uh, it would have been really difficult uh, to get where we are today because it's two steps back, uh, two steps forward and one steps back sometime uh, and you need uh, to be able to try this out and to uh, go through things in a bit of an iterative process if you want to uh, figure out what's best. You can't always be right the first time. Um, so I think with that actually we have the keys in hand to address most of the challenges that we're facing and it's quite an exciting uh, process. We're looking forward to, uh, to actually getting on with it in the coming uh, years and uh, bringing things further uh, through our work. Thanks very much. That was a really, really interesting talk. Uh, I have to apologise that I'm now <laughs> holding this ridiculous. <laughs> I'm not mic'd up like you guys. But um, for me personally, it was really interesting to hear about the big challenges that we're facing, the big context, um, but also some really inspiring examples of what is possible and what is happening on the ground. And um, so I've got a couple of specific questions about what you said, which um, <clears throat> I'd like to get into, but first, for my own um, interest, I wanted to also just ask a first question about cities themselves and the context they provide, because I mentioned at the start that uh, cities op or, uh, take up about 3% of the Earth's surface, but they, um, they also use about three quarters of the world's resources. So beyond all these very specific examples, um, is there also a huge challenge in terms of the waste that uh, cities produce and the and the scale of that waste given how much resources the, the things that we use and buy in cities is and, and is that is a is that a question of design or what's the solution for that but I'm going to ask you Nadine on this one <laughs> I think you've you've touched on a very important point which is that um, moving towards any of this we of we have to examine everything from a life cycle perspective and currently um, in you know this take may make waste society where we where we live in now um, there is some focus on that on that end of life um, use phase and very much focused on how can we take these things and um, maybe like take them apart a little bit and hopefully recycle a little bit and, and that's about it and that's going to be a very key challenge especially as populations and urban centers are increasing more products used um, it's not going to be enough just to um, recycle bits and pieces of them what we really have to move to is, is go on the opposite end of the spectrum and start with design. They say that 80% um, that of, um, of an environmental impact of a product can have is, is at the design phase. And what I mean by that is if you can think very critically about um, 
about what, what is happening uh, at, at that phase and making sure you're designing things that can be easily disassembled, uh, things that uh, are meant to last, uh, things that can be refurbished. That is going to be a key in not only making sure we can recycle better down the line, but eventually making sure we're drastically reducing the amount of waste that we're producing. They say at the end of the day that um, that waste is just a design flaw. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so uh, back to your talk then, and uh, Gerard, this one's for you. You mentioned um, about the black box, which is a very interesting concept in terms of kind of sustainable city thinking. Um, it, can you give a, couple, a bit more information about how Metabolic is working to break open this black box? Um, yeah, I think one of the uh, um, <clears throat> one of the key things we're, we're we're doing now is to also quite actively uh, um, start to participate in collaborations with. Uh, academic institutions with the University uh, uh, of Amsterdam but also with the Amsterdam Metropolitan Solutions Institute and what we've seen there is that um, <coughs> a lot of the questions that we have are even still for these uh, uh, scientists that are actually at the forefront of these developments still questions as well uh, so um, there are uh, uh, models of the metabolism of cities but they're mostly um, um, set up in a way that we figure out how much goes in, how much goes out, but why and how and what the processes behind all of this are, it's very difficult. So now for the first time with 3D, 4G, uh, 4D uh, GIS, with uh, new developments uh, in the realm of software also uh, trying to map these flows, we see that we are beginning to uh, uh, get to that more interesting point where you can actually look at the internal dynamics of cities and figure out how you can tweak those to create more circular resource flows. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a really interesting question. We're approaching that with uh, uh, our, our partners in the realm of academic research. And aside from that, uh, we are also aiming to develop software ourselves um, that is going to be able to map these uh, map flows throughout the city in a much more context specific way. So it's going to map them not just in uh, uh, Amsterdam in general, but it's going to map the, the, the timeline of these flows. So it's going to be a dynamic model and we're going to aim for also uh, um, getting much more fine grained in terms of the locations where flows are released, reused and produced uh, throughout the city. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of work happening um, with Metabolic and a lot of that work is happening with Amsterdam where we're based. Uh, what can other cities do to learn from Amsterdam or perhaps work more um, practically with us on some of these challenges? Uh, one of the key opportunities to, uh, for cities to engage with us is uh, the Circular Cities program that we're setting up at the moment. In this we are uh, really looking for uh, a structural partnership with uh, uh, a larger number of cities, preferably an international coalition. Uh, that wants to uh, um, uh, get involved actively in the transition towards uh, a circular city by also setting up the similar type of living lab that we've seen here in Bauxloter Ham. Uh, so throughout the program we are going to help cities to identify uh, uh, the neighborhoods and the areas in the city that might be uh, well suited for this type of uh, uh, development and this type of transition. And then we're going to actively help them uh, uh, in uh, setting that up and uh, bringing all the parties on board um, they would need for this development uh, and see if we can actually use the lessons that we've learned here in Bijksloterham and here in Amsterdam uh, to speed up the transition elsewhere as well. Fantastic, thank you. And um, okay, back to Nadine. I'd like to ask you a um, quick question about the uh, the empowerment issue um, mm -hmm. and how we can uh, how we intend to empower more people to learn from these things to take them forward. Because I suppose a lot of these a lot of people who want to engage in this topic might not necessarily be in positions of authority necessarily or be able to um, apply tendering rules. So how can we empower more people to engage in this topic? Yeah, it's good you ask because um, empowerment is really a, a, a key, it's really at the heart of, of metabolic. It's something that I mentioned before too, wanting to go further than just developing you know, reports, collecting dust, but really making sure our skills and, and, and research that we've done is being translated to as many people as possible. Um, and one of the ways concretely that we're doing that is I'm really excited to announce that uh, this summer, uh, July 2018, we'll be launching our very first summer school uh, called The Circular City Towards a Sustainable Urban Ecosystem. Uh, it's hosted uh, in collaboration with the University of Amsterdam 
and it's great to have them on board. I think it'll be very interesting to not only have a summer school that combines uh, this um, on the grounds perspective with an academic one and bringing those together, um, but also it's it's the first of its kind. It'll be a three-week program. Um, we're very focused on uh, making sure that we're getting a very diverse group of students. These can be anyone from, from master's, PhD students, but we're also looking to get professionals and young professionals on board, um, and especially people that are working on these issues in their home cities and feel like maybe they just they're at you know a stopping block or they hit they're, they're at an obstacle point um, and we hope that we can translate a lot of what we've done here in Amsterdam and invite these students to experiment with Bijkstoser home and with this living lab environment and see what it's like for themselves and immerse themselves in it for for three weeks and at the same time be able to share our lessons and and hopefully see almost like a virus see, see this approach happen in a, a globally across cities across the world Fantastic. And what do people need to do if they want to sign up? Head to the website? Head to the website. Okay. Yeah. Answer for everything. Head to the website. Maybe we can link it down below or something. I'll we'll try and do that. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to thank Gerard and Nadine for this really fascinating talk. If you'd like to know anything more about our city's work, then please head to our website, metabolic.nl. Um, there you can also sign up for our newsletter and we'll be sharing regular news and stories about our work in circular cities and beyond. So thanks once again and uh, enjoy the rest of the Disruptive Innovation Festival.